Thank you, and thank you to um, everyone involved in organizing this. Uh, I don't have that much time, so I think I'm going to get with it. Um, I really enjoyed that first talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so before I start talking about story and creativity, I would like to borrow something from uh, the great Chicagoan artist called Theaster Gates. Theaster Gates talks a lot about the thing behind the thing. And we are very used to finish, seeing the finished product of something. But it's not often that we get to find out the strands and stories that make the finished product. And often, every artist would attest that these strands and stories are, are myriad and sometimes complex and sometimes nuanced um, to make the finished work. So take, take that as my, my theme, the thing behind the thing. Um, so I had the opportunity uh, years back to go to something called the Afro-Europe's conference uh, with a company called Speaking Volumes. And I'm always trying to be the dumbest person in the room when I'm there. So at the Afro-Europe's conference, they had all these black European lecturers from around the world. This was a perfect opportunity for me to be as dumb as humanly possible. So I'd wake up every morning for breakfast and see if I could sit in one of these lectures and just listen to what they're talking about, what their presentations might be about to see if I might learn something. I have to be honest with you, some of them were a bit spiky, so I didn't often have long conversations, but I did get to have a long conversation with one called Henry Mainsa at the R4 Europe's conference. And Henry Mainsa, over our coffee and croissants, he, um, he talked a lot about something called creative citizenship. And this pricked my ears up really quickly. And I was like, wow, creative citizenship. And his definition of creative citizenship, I may be paraphrasing here, was um, to really use creativity to bunk and reject all stale notions of citizenship, who it belongs to, and who deserves it. Uh, so that was very interesting to me, and it, it kind of set me on a course of thinking about what the focus of my creativity is. Perhaps I could go on to, to um, really think about creative citizenship as a central focus of my work. Only to hear from him when I told him about my history, he says, well, everything you've been doing is about creative citizenship. You just haven't given it the name. I was like, wow, that, that was super interesting. And then, so to be clear, creative citizenship has existed for a long time. And this was just a new name for it. Everyone from Bernadine Evaristo, who is now the Booker Prize winner, but allowing me to come on workshops some 24 years ago for free. And I, when I was but a younger man on open mics, um, that was creative citizenship. Linton Quincy Johnson talking about police oppression and not just being a musician or a writer, but really trying to nearly be documentarian about the suffering of black British people. That to some extent was creative citizenship. So it's not a new term. And in, in, within the idea of creative citizenship, there's a, there, there are much um, there are new and interesting people who are doing it. When you think about Inua Elam's play, um, Evening with an Immigrant. You think of the work of Afua Hirsch and her book, British. So creative citizenship had been in the air. Um, but I didn't think that creative citizenship was a thing that I could have done. It didn't really galvanize uh, my, galvanize or become concretized in my creative, in my creative work until the conversation with, um, with Dr. Henry Mainsa. But there's another thing I realized about creative citizenship. Uh, and in order to talk about that, I have to take you way back. And this is the further thing behind the thing. This is the story behind the story, behind the story, behind the story. And you'll have to picture me as a nine-year-old, quite chubby, um, open up a sandwich, a foil package of cheese sandwiches, driving with my mom 
who was a district nurse. And we're driving a long distance and I got my packs and boxes of apple juice. And she was what you call a visiting district nurse. And the interesting thing about her as a visiting district nurse is that she would often have to deal with rural areas. And this is back in Trinidad now, this is not England. She'd have to deal with visiting rural areas. And I mean really rural in Trinidad. But the thing about rural areas is that people were very, very suspicious of, of anybody who wasn't from their immediate surroundings. So it was often hard for uh, nurses to make that connection and to give them their kind of medical treatment. So as a young boy, we drive to some rural town and, and someone would meet us in some orange grove and we'd pick a bunch of oranges and we'd walk back slowly to their house and sit in their gallery and they'd make us food. And, my mother and this woman would be trading story after story each day. My mother would have her feet up. They would cook food and we'd eat and be laughing and talking and, and just generally exchanging uh, information. And this woman in that rural area will often be uh, somebody quite influential to her peers. So 30 minutes before we were to leave, what would happen is that my mom would start taking out injections and pills and start dispensing medicine to people and people will come from the brushy shadows and um and you should give the medicine and then we were off we were off on a long trip home now when i was young i used to think man my mom likes to hang out but i i didn't understand what exactly it is she was doing now I understand the function of story. I see how she transforms story into a form that could help people with survival by building levels of trust, finding information about people who may be struggling, also giving lessons about health through story. I had a form of creative citizenship right in front of me all my life. Sure, my mother enjoyed the process, but she also knew that her creative approach was necessary, humane, and connecting. When so many nurses in these areas before her failed to make those connections to provide good health because they didn't have her storied communication and skill. Perhaps I already had a model I could draw upon. Perhaps there could be some best practice I could take from here. Something about creating a platform where one's sacred stories, i.e. the moments that define a life and traumatic hurt could be told. Something about bringing the margins to the center. And there was something about my mother listening to them and being heard and making them visible. Something about the role of stories and empathy. My time's running out. Let me take you quickly back six or seven years ago when I was trying to, you know, plant some closer seeds, some closer things to the thing of the book. I had decided I had lived in England more than I'd lived in Trinidad, and I, and I was Black British. I was going to have a child. I was planning to have a child. And it made me start thinking about the role of my writing on English society made me start to look at what was actually happening in, in Black British society specifically. So things happened. So I, I, I thought about how I could transfer the idea of the paradise where I was raised in Trinidad and transfer it to England in some way. Make that paradise portable. And then things happened in increments. You had the Windrush um, debacle where they were taking West Indian elders and asking them to come in for a meeting and send them on a plane the next day without letting them make calls. There was a Grenfell disaster where black people died in a tower block, not just black people, but there were many black and brown people who died in it. So these things began to come in, the politics began to come in in increments in the poem. And I began to look at the book and think about the value of black bodies, how devalued black bodies had become in the British English, in the British English in industry, the media industry, and even the literary industry. And I thought to myself, perhaps, perhaps this poetry book is a place where I can make black people visible. Perhaps this poetry book is a place where I can add value to their lives. Perhaps this poetry book is a place where I could um, revalue people, especially Black English people who had been absent for so long from poetry books, from literature. There are lots of studies about this now, talking about the exclusion of Black British people from, from, from books and, and, and media. But they were always here. 
So that was my goal. So I set about trying to do that. Um, and and it, the process being driven on by its own dialectic, whilst I'm trying to make Black British people visible, more and more things are coming up where Black people are devalued and not visible. And understanding that when you have significant hurt and trauma within groups of people, it's important to have platforms where these stories are shared. And perhaps to some extent, ameliorate these stories. I run out of time quickly. I'm going to talk, I'm going to read a quick poem about um, my son who had a traumatic birth and a West Indian woman who often, a West Indian nurse who are often not made visual, who helped with that. It's called Grace. And also, too, this is a love letter to the NHS. Grace. That year, we danced to the green bleeps on screens. My son had come early, just the one kilogram of him, all big head, bulging eyes, and blue veins. On the ward, I met Grace, a Jamaican senior nurse who sang pop songs on her shift like they were hymns. Your son's face, T. He just pulling off all the breathing masks. People spoke of her in half tones down these carbolic halls. Even doctors gave way to her when it came to putting a line into my son's nylon thread of a vein. She'd warned junior doctors with trembling hands, I'm only letting you try twice. On her night shift, she would pull my son's incubator into her room, no matter the tangled confusion of wires and machine. When the consultant told my wife and I on morning rounds that he's not sure my son will live, and if he lives, he might never leave the hospital. She pulled us quickly aside. He have no right to say that, just raw so. Another consultant tells the nurses to stop feeding a baby who will soon die. And she commands her loyal nurses to feed him. Feed him. No baby must dead with a hungry belly. And she sit in the dark, rocking that well-fed baby held to her bosom, slowly humming the melody of Happy by Pharrell. And I think if by some chance I'm not here, and my son's life should flicker, then Grace, she should be the one. I want to end quickly by taking you back to the story of my mother. What I left out of my mother's story was this, was after she made that long trip home, she would stay up most of the night making notes so she can remember everything that she wrote. So her creativity had some purpose. And all the things that she wrote and all the reports was that she wrote was a duty of care so that money can be sent to these rural people who are not often contacted. I'm gonna leave there, but I think that's a good topic to end on. We're in a situation now where there's a lot of trauma in a lot of people with less privilege. What is it that we can do? What is our duty of care? Let me leave you with a few things. One thing you can do is if you have access to space, allow people to come into that space and talk about their invested trauma and help them to try and make it creatively. If, as Gary Young says, the great journalist Gary Young, if you have privilege, use your privilege now and use it to leverage on behalf of people who don't privilege. More and more, use stories, people's stories, to try and bring care, empathy to other people's lives. I hope that all makes sense. Thank you very much for listening.